Well, hello everybody. In this video, I'm going to try and help you to learn how to identify the frogs and toads or anurans of North Dakota, both by sight and by sound. So before we get into that, I, uh, as in all videos and, and images, all the animals have been handled with proper permits, uh, proper sa safety precautions, and released back into the wild. Um, we encourage that you respect all wildlife. Um, and again, just because you see us handling these animals in the videos, we don't encourage everyone to go out and handle wildlife. Please respect your local flora and fauna and consult your local game agency, specifically North Dakota Game and Fish, about regulations on interacting with wildlife and, um, and vegetation. If you have questions, if you need help identifying anything, if you want to incorporate information about the reptiles and amphibians or herps of North Dakota into your curriculum, please reach out and contact us so you can get a hold of North Dakota Game and Fish. Um, <clears throat> there's several people there that can help you. You can email me either at uh, my NDSU address, matthew.thomas.smith at ndsu.edu, or my personal uh, email here, uh, or you can uh, find me on Twitter at herpecomorph. Uh, again, we're always here to help. Uh, if you're going to be out and about in the great state of North Dakota, we encourage that you help us out and um, upload the observations that you have to herpmapper.org. So if you're out on a camping trip and you see a frog, uh, you know, get on the Herp Mapper app, take a quick picture, upload that to the database, and that helps North Dakota Game and Fish and myself um, better understand the reptile and amphibian populations of North Dakota, where they are and, and how they're doing. Uh, you can also access that same portal through uh, the ndherpatlas.org. Okay, so the, the frogs and toads of North Dakota, they're both amphibians. Uh, so frogs, toads, and salamanders, those are the three types of amphibians we have in North Dakota. Amphibians really have two definitive traits. I mean, they have lots of other things that make them great and unique, but there's two big things that set amphibians apart from reptiles. Um, the first one is that the majority of amphibians have a complex life history, meaning that they have sort of this juvenile or larval stage and an adult stage. So, um, so the juveniles undergo metamorphosis. They have a, 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 pretty, uh, a big change between what they look like as a baby and what they look like as an adult. Okay? So generally, uh, the amphibians start as eggs laid in a body of water. They hatch into tadpoles or an aquatic larvae that is typically uh, herbaceous, so they typically feed on plant matter. Uh, and then they undergo metamorphosis. They um, gain legs, they lose their tail, and those aquatic larvae turn into terrestrial adults, which are carnivorous, as they eat uh, bugs, right? They eat meat. Um, and so again, every species in North Dakota does this. Not every species of amphibian worldwide does, but all the ones in North Dakota do. Uh, and this really ties amphibians more closely to water than it does reptiles, right? They need water bodies in order to reproduce. Um, and so uh, their life cycle looks something like this, where they're laid as eggs in an aquatic setting. Um, the frogs and toads lay their eggs a little bit differently than each other, and so do salamanders. Those hatch and um, are generally referred to as tadpoles, and so the early tadpoles look a little bit different than the later tadpoles, but uh, these look a little more like fish, except they don't have um, the pectoral fins, and they swim around these aquatic settings eating mostly uh, decaying plant matter, although that's not the case in every species. Um, some species are tadpoles for only a few days, some can be tadpoles or larval stage for over a year, and then the, the larvae or the tadpole starts to undergo metamorphosis, so they'll gain the back legs first and then the front legs, and they'll start to uh, see systematic changes across their body. And then we have like a froglet or a toadlet here, which looks mostly like a frog with just a little bit of the remnant tail um, and they leave the wetland or the aquatic body and and then finish metamorphosis and become an adult frog or toad or salamander okay? so it's this complex life cycle the second definitive trait about amphibians is the presence of skin not scales so reptiles have skin but that skin is covered with scales 
that helps prevent from water loss and um, separates it from its environment a little more. Amphibians have this really thin permeable skin, uh, so they lack scales. Uh, their skin needs to maintain sort of a certain level of moisture. Uh, it's relatively thin, so they actually can use it as a respiratory organ. They can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide with the environment through their skin. Um, but this makes them susceptible to water loss or dehydration, and it also makes them susceptible to environmental pollutants um, through diffusion more than, than reptiles. So we've got this complex life cycle and thin permeable skin. Those are the two definitive traits of amphibians. If we ask ourselves, what's the difference between frogs and toads? Um, if we look globally, there's some, some gray areas here, but in general, especially in North Dakota, frogs have smooth, moist skin. They lay their eggs in clusters, right, so big, um, big groups. They are more closely tied to water than our toads, so they usually live nearer in water. Um, they tend to have sort of more skinny, elongate bodies with very long hind limbs. Now, toads also have long hind limbs, but if we look at the relative size, frogs would have much longer hind limbs than toads. Um, frogs move in leaps and jumps, so they um, tend to move large distances in a single jump. And their upper jaw can have teeth. This isn't really the case in North Dakota, um, but it is across the globe. To toads have thicker, drier, uh, and what is often referred to as wartier skin, or they have warts. Uh, again, they're not true warts. You don't get warts by handling toads. Um, when they lay their eggs, they, they lay them in strands, and so you get long lines of eggs rather than thick clusters. Um, aside from reproducing, they're generally found farther away from the water, so they tend to be less tied to water because they have thicker skin that can avoid uh, dehydration a little bit better. They have sort of shorter, stouter bodies, and even though their hind limbs are much longer than their forelimbs, those limbs are short in comparison to a frog of the same size. And so toads don't really jump, they sort of hop, so they make short little hops rather than large leaps or jumps. And uh, neither of their jaws have teeth. The other thing that's uh, distinctive about frogs and toads is that when they go through their breeding season, they, the males will call to attract females. So um, frogs and toads we can identify visually, but also in the spring we can identify them just through their calls. So in fact, this morning I, when I was walking my dogs, I had heard the first uh, frog calls of the spring, so I heard chorus frogs and wood frogs this morning. Um, different species breed at different times. Generally we see that the chorus frogs and the wood frogs start calling first. These are the two species that um, sort of overwinter on land and so they're the first to thaw out. So wood frogs will actually let themselves um, sort of freeze. Uh, and chorus frogs have some freeze tolerance mechanisms. And so chorus frogs are smaller, so they sort of thaw out and warm up quicker. So they'll start calling relatively early in the spring. Uh, they'll breed sort of mid-March to mid-May, um, but the males will call pretty much all summer. You can, you can hear chorus frogs calling almost any time in the summer after a rainfall event. That doesn't mean the frogs are breeding, but the males are still calling. Wood frogs also start pretty early, again, maybe about the same time or a few days to a week after the chorus frogs start calling. If the temperature's right, you'll start hear, hearing wood frogs. They tend not to breed as long. They, um, you'll see sort of this really quick escalation of the, the mating period, and so it will get really intense really quick and then die off relatively quickly, and you don't hear them calling for uh, after the breeding season is over. Uh, the next are northern leopard frogs. They'll start in late March to early April. Again, it, this all depends on uh, the spring weather. Um, their breeding season is a little bit longer um, than the wood frogs, uh, but you see they don't call after breeding season is over. American and Canadian toads are next. Um, sometimes they can start calling earlier, so I've heard them calling before northern leopard frogs in some years but generally it's more towards mid-April that you hear the toads start to call. Uh, again, they have a relatively short breeding season, but male toads will call after a rain event uh, basically throughout the summer. You can hear them in a flooded ditch, and even though there's no females present, the males are calling. 
And then the gray tree frogs, uh, they'll start to call early, but generally they start to breed later in the season, so maybe in mid to late May, and they'll breed through maybe mid-July. So they're one of the last species to really call and um, during their breeding season. So again, some of the species call later, but they're not breeding, but the gray tree frogs are sort of the last to breed of the frogs and toads. So let's get into the species. Uh, we'll start with the first or the first one we'll start with is the smallest. It's the boreal chorus frog, Sudacris maculata. So it's the smallest amphibian in North Dakota. At max, it gets about three quarters of an inch, right? So it's not even an inch long. Um, they're incredibly variable in their color. So I think one of the more common would be brown, but they have bronze, gray, olive, reds, oranges, lots of variation in their color. Um, regardless of the color, you almost always see three longitudinal stripes down their back. So if we see, um, again, this isn't a solid stripe, but we can see three bands of dark markings down their back. Uh, in some of the other pictures, you can see it better, but they've got really small toe pads. So um, this isn't a true tree frog, but it's in the same group as a tree frog. So they do spend some time uh, sort of above the ground. They, they are good climbers and these toe pads help them sort of stick. Um, and chorus frogs, again, um, even though they're small and you may not see very many of them, they do, they are found throughout the state. They are active callers. Um, and they're just a little more difficult to find, but they're probably one of the more uh, common frogs across the state. So if we look some more images here, you can see that really the, the great color variation that there is. So here we can see sort of this bronze background coloration with green stripes down its back. Here again we've got the sort of this tan with a darker brown. Here's a sort of a tan with green stripes. Um, here that you can see the, the stripes are really more sort of like blotches. Here's a nice red version here. This almost looks like a small wood frog which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but it is not, it's a chorus frog. And again, here's the, the more typical sort of light brown coloration, dark brown stripes. So again, lots of variation, but you can see in each case, very small, less than an inch. Here you can see those nice little toe pads, right? Um, really just gorgeous frogs, but they're small and they tend to be hard to find if you don't know what you're looking for. Uh, but again, we have records of them throughout the state, almost every county, so they have sort of a statewide distribution. Their call, uh, I can pretty much guarantee you've all heard them call, even if you don't realize it. So um, it's sort of this long creaking sound or sort of a, a chirping cricket sound. You might think they're an insect. Um, the best analogy that I can come up with, if you take a comb and run your fingers down the times of a comb, that's what... Uh, the chorus frog call sounds like. So let's take a listen to um, the chorus frog call here. So this is multiple call frogs calling. You can see here is some wind, but you can hear that creaking. We can um, take a quick look at a video of one calling in a, in a flooded prairie. Um, I apologize for the light, but uh, you'll be able to see the uh, vocal sac of the chorus frog expand as it calls here. So here's just the one frog so you can get a better idea of what the call sounds like. You can see the abdomen expands and then the vocal sac, the sac uh, branches out as it calls. So it's got one large vocal sac. So again, they'll be one of the first frogs calling in the spring. And males will typically call all year round, especially after rain events. But their breeding season only lasts a few weeks. Uh, the next frog we'll talk about is... Uh, the one true tree frog uh, that we have in North Dakota, the Cope's gray tree frog, Hyla chrysosilis. Um, this is probably undergoing a common name change, so we'll just call it the gray tree frog for now. Um, 
This one's a bit larger. It's about an inch and a half to two inches in length. The toe pads, if we look at the image here, you can see the toe pads or the toe discs are much larger than they were on the uh, chorus rug. Uh, these are typically found well above uh, the ground level, right? Um, they can be bright green to light gray, and the same individual can be that. They have a, um, the ability to sort of change the distribution of their pigment molecules, so they can change color to match their background or to heat up faster or cool down faster. And so any given tree frog can be bright green one minute and light gray a couple minutes later. Um, the hind legs typically have orange or yellow markings sort of on the inner thigh. Uh, you won't see those on this image, but um, if you can see one jump, you'll see that there's sort of orange on the inner or yellow on the inner thigh. Um, the hind legs also tend to have some black markings on them. These are found primarily only in eastern North Dakota. Um, so again, if we take a look, that's the same guy as last time. Here, this one is a darker gray, but again, you can see those really nice toe pads. They stick to surfaces really well. Here's one that still has got the tail. So this one is just leaving the wetland after metamorphosis, but you can see how bright green it is. Here's one that's sort of a lighter green. Uh, again, these really nice toe pads. Um, and here's a couple in situ, as you can see them in the tree and on the leaf here. This is the, really the same individual here. But even when they're bright green, you can see they have some gray markings. Um, we can see a little bit of the yellow on the hind legs here. Uh, again, these are, in my opinion, one of the, the best looking frogs we have in the state. Uh, really, really adorable animals. Um, so here's another one. In Minnesota, we have the eastern gray tree frog. Um, and they basically look identical to the, to the Cope's gray tree frog. Uh, they differ sort of histolo uh, in histology uh, and genetics, and their call is different. But um, if we had one in each hand, if you just have to look at them, they're sort of identical. But we don't have any records of the eastern gray tree frogs in North Dakota. We just have the Cope's, or what was called the Cope's tree frog in North Dakota. Um, obviously they're a tree frogs, so they are associated with trees, but they're really more often associated with small patches of trees in, in a prairie habitat. Whereas the eastern tree frog on the Minnesota side, those are more associated with large uh, forests or woodlands, right? So if you've ever been to Minnesota lake country in the summer, let's say you have a lake cabin and you've seen a frog on your glass patio door at night, that's an eastern gray tree frog. Um, those are quite common in Minnesota. But on the North Dakota side, again, it's the Cope's Gray Tree Frog, or uh, whatever we change the name to, most likely it'll end up being called the Western Gray Tree Frog. Um, and again, they are associated with trees, but it's trees in prairie habitat. Again, mostly in eastern North Dakota, we do have a few records in central North Dakota. Those are probably um, some small remnant populations. Um, and again, they don't often occur in large numbers, um, but there are a few sites where they can be locally abundant. Again, this is the last species that breeds in North Dakota. Uh, so it's not the last species that calls in North Dakota, but it is the last um, species to breed in North Dakota. It tends to breed later in the year. Their tadpoles get this really beautiful red coloration on them when they sense predators in the wetlands. Um, again, their voice is different than the eastern tree frog, but it's uh, sort of similar. So they have this sort of raspy, resonating trill. It's, um, so the trill of the eastern tree frog is really quite musical or more bird-like. The trill of the Cope's gray tree frog is sort of less musical, a little harsher or more raspy or sort of more insect sounding than it, or mechanical sounding rather than bird sounding. So let's take a, a listen to a few examples here. And just quick trills. Something you may have thought was a bug at night when you were camping, but is actually a Cope's gray tree frog. Again, sort of this raspy nature to it. The eastern is much more musical. We won't go through the eastern really. And 
just this quick trill. Uh, at peak breeding season, there's going to be lots of individuals calling one right after another, but they're all just this short little raspy trill. Okay, on to the next species. It's the northern leopard frog, Lithobates pipiens, or Rana pipiens, depending on uh, who you talk to. Uh, this is the largest frog we have in North Dakota. It can get over three inches long. Highly variable in coloration. Now, brown and green are the two most common variations, but there's lots of variations in between that. I've seen some bluish, some bronze, some gold, some orange, um, lots of uh, variation. The leopard is sort of um, after this the spotting pattern, and so the spots are sort of randomly placed around the backs and the sides. There are two other morphs, um, same species, just different patterns. One has no spots and one has about two to three times the number of spots, so we'll see some examples there. But the typical northern leopard frog is either brown or green with these large black spots on the backs and sides. And again, they're found statewide. They're probably the most common frog in North Dakota in areas. Okay, so here's uh, one that's green sitting on some cattail. Again, the, the spots here look a little more green than black, but again, located on the sides and the backs and on both legs. Right? So here's some more examples here. Here again is a green example with black. Here's a brown example with sort of green spots. These are the normal morph. There's two other what we call morphs or sort of pa uh, patterns. There's the Bernsey eye phase. So this one in the upper left and the one in the middle you notice that they don't have any spots really. So Bernsey eye is a lack of spots. So here you can see this nice green without any um, real spots. This one is sort of a, a, a bronzish gold again with few to, to no spots. In some other states, these would be easily confused for other species. In, in North Dakota, we don't have things like the bronze frog or the green frog or the bullfrog. Um, so we know these are leopard frogs. These are just the burns the eye phase. They just lack the, the pigmentation for the, for the spots. The other phase or morph is called the candy uh, So this photo is um, courtesy of <clears throat> excuse me, Chris Smith of the Minnesota um, Department of Transportation. And they have two to three times the number of spots. So if we look at sort of the number of spots here, it's just a few rows um, with a few spots. Here we can see lots and lots of spots on the back, the sides, and the legs. So the normal phase would be something like this. Burns the eye is no dots or spots, or basically very few. In candy ohi would be two to three times the number of spots or, or blotches. Again, all leopard frogs, it's just that they come in lots of colors, and then we have sort of the normal phase and the two special phases. Again, we can find them throughout the state, um, and since they're one of the larger frogs, they're often easier to find than chorus frogs, so you probably uh, get the impression that this is um, a very common frog, and, and often is. Uh, their call is, is very interesting, so they sort of have this long, drawn-out rattling, followed by a sort of a low snore, and then sometimes they do these short little clucks. And so it's, um, it's much more variable than some of the other calls that we've um, heard before. I always, in order for me to remember who, which sound is which, I always call leopard frog sort of the creepy pig. So it's sort of these oinks followed by a, 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 an evil laugh. So they've got these sort of these long oinks and then this quick evil laugh. So let's take some, or listen to a few examples here. So there's those long drown out sort of oinks or rattles followed by a couple quick clucks, right? Uh, and so that was taken of one individual sort of in an artificial setting. What you're gonna hear more likely in, in the wild will be like these next two clips. Um, often they're calling in the distance because they won't call when they're disturbed. Um, so you're just gonna hear something or sound a little something more like this. Again, that distant sort of low snore or rattling. 
and then some clucks. So here we have some birds calling, but you can hear in the background sort of that low snore. So again, a little more of a variable call than we um, are used to with some of the other species, uh, but fairly distinctive. Uh, the next species is the wood frog, Lithobates sabbaticus. Um, this is about the, the second largest frog in North Dakota. It's about two, two and a half inches. Um, again, lots of variation in color, sort of these browns to these pinks or these really kind of reddish oranges or salmon colors. Um, in some areas, they're, the, they're sexually dimorphic, so males are one color, females are another color. I'm actually not sure if that's the case in North Dakota, but they did find that in some other populations in the U.S. Um, they don't really have a lot of markings. You can see they have some banding on the legs, but none really on the back and sides to speak of, although that's not always the case. But really the definitive thing about the wood frog is this black mask that it has over its eyes and this nice white lip. So regardless of the background color or if it's got spots or not, you're going to see that a black mask across each eye, so it looks like it's a burglar, right? And then sort of this really bright white upper lip. Um, those two characteristics should be uh, easily recognizable regardless of sort of the variation in background color and, and spotting. Um, wood frogs are found throughout most of the state except in the southwest. I mean, as you would imagine, given the name, wood frog, um, <clears throat> that we need wooded habitat in order for the, uh, this species to exist. So we see them in the Red River Valley and then sort of uh, through the north, central, and northwest part of the, the state, but in the south, central, and the uh, southwest portion where there's little to no trees, of course we don't find wood frogs. Okay? Here's some more uh, pictures, again sort of this darker brown, but again the dark mask and the white lip. Again you can see the banding on the legs. Um, again here's one in situ up on a, a tree branch. Here's some of those nice bright colors, so we can see this sort of orangish red or salmon color, but again, the dark mask and the white lip. And here's a juvenile individual. We can see there's some markings here on the back, and again, those bands on the leg. But again, what's the common factor? This dark mask around the eyes and the bright white lip. Again, found throughout this, or I shouldn't say throughout, said through a large portion of the state, through the Red River Valley, up through north central and northwest, um, but again, fairly absent from uh, south central and southwest portions of the state. Um, their voice is uh, fairly distinctive as well. Um, you can, it might be difficult to tell it apart from leopard frogs early on, but after you've listened to enough of them, uh, it's fairly distinctive. I'm going to date myself here by saying that it reminds me of the laugh from the from the Revenge of the Nerds. Um, some of you are going to be too young to get that reference, but we'll, let's take a listen to some of these calls. So we're going to these quick little rack, 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 or sort of like. They sort of sound like ducks, right? A bunch of ducks talking to each other. So again, wood frogs tend to, to escalate their breeding season quite quickly, so when there's one or two, it might be a little hard to recognize, but generally the next night you're going to see there's a bunch of wood frogs all calling, sort of doing this quacking or racking together. Um, here's a quick little video. You're going to see, here's some other species in the background, but we'll look at the wood frog. The wood frog has two vocal sacs, so you'll see one come out of each side here as he calls. 
And again, we know it's a male because only the males call. So there's chorus frogs. But there, that other... There you go. You can see the vocal sides, sax calling out each side. And the quick rack rack or quack quack. Let's listen to it and see it again. Okay, so that moves us on from the frogs to the toads. Okay, so um, the first toad we'll talk about is the Canadian toad, Anaxorus hemiophrys. Um, this toad and the American toad are very difficult to tell apart, but um, currently I think the American toad is extirpated from North Dakota, so I don't think we, we have it any longer. Uh, but we'll talk about ways to differentiate them. They sound different. Um, they look very similar, but there's a couple quick things to look at to tell them apart. Uh, but let's just start by talking about the Canadian toad itself. It's about three inches in length on the, the larger side. Again, obviously, they're, they're not always that size. Uh, they're found through large portions of the state, um, except for out west. We tend to see them in the east and central part uh, of the state, and they don't get all the way out west. The background color tends to be sort of this lighter cream to darker brown. Um, aside from the background color, they've got these colored spots. So in these, they look sort of greenish to brown. And in those spots, they have warts that can be varied color. These are sort of a reddish orange. And generally, there's one to three warts per spot. Although, again, not always the case. Sometimes there's four or five or six warts per spot. Again, you don't get warts by touching toad warts. They're just referred to as warts. Um, they have a cream or light or whitish belly, um, but the belly is covered in dark spots, and that's going to be important when we get to some of the other species, as the American and Canadian toad have speckled bellies or spotted bellies, and the others do not. So here we'll take a couple looks. Here's a, a look at the belly or the ventral side. Here's a look at the back or the dorsal side. So again, sort of this cream belly with black speckling or spotting. That's typical of a Canadian toad. Here we have sort of a lighter cream background color. Sometimes they have this white line down the back, although that's not guaranteed. Um, and we can see these darker spots, and then in the spots we see this reddy, these reddish orange warts. Okay, so you have sort of this cream to brown background coloration with dark brown or green spots, and then in the spots we tend to see red to orange warts. Uh, that coupled with the Spotted belly is going to tell us it's a, a Canadian or an American toad. And in, um, in a second, we'll show you how we tell whether it's an American toad or a Canadian toad. But here's some more images. Okay, again, here's a young one with spotted belly. We can see these um, dark spots with the warts. Uh, the other thing that we're going to, how we distinguish this from an American toad is we look at the cranial crest between the eyes, but this. Uh, the Canadian toads have a U between their eyes. Okay. Here's a few others. These have a darker background color. Background coloration tends to be influenced heavily by the environment that they're in. And so in a sandier environment, you would expect a light, lighter toads. In um, sort of a more agricultural or soil-based habitat, you would expect these darker uh, background toads. So this one was found in the forest. This one was found in sort of... Um, grasslands by some, some wetlands which with uh, that didn't really have sandy soil. But again, here we've got a nice cream belly with um, spotting on it. Uh, here's the distribution map, again, found up and down the Red River Valley and sort of in the north central and northwest portion, but we really quite absent from most of the western portion of the state. There's some older records from um, the central, south central portion of the state, um, but those need to probably be um, verified for um, more recent uh, observations. The toads, the American and the Canadian toads, really sort of have this. Again, it's, in toads, it's always called a trill, but it's sort of a, a, a scream almost. Um, but it's this really rapid trill. 
And in Canadian toads, it, it only lasts three to five, three to six seconds. At max, a Canadian toad's gonna call for about 15 seconds at a time. That's important because the American toads call basically twice as long. So generally they're six to 10 seconds with 30 seconds on max. Um, American toads tend to have a higher pitch. Canadian toads tend to have a lower pitch. Um, again, it's sort of softer and less musical than the American toads. Um, I spent some time in the south, so they remind me of cicadas, um, but um, you may not be as familiar with those uh, if you haven't spent time in states that have larger cicada populations. So let's listen. So that one's sort of distance. This, we'll pick one up that's closer here in a second. There, so the, sort of that trill on, off, right? About five or six seconds of call. Sort of lower pitch, so it's harder to pull out of the background. Let's stop this one. There, see that trill? There, just a few seconds. So when it's only a handful of toads, there tends to be a lot of dead air in between calls. Now as the breeding season ramps up and you get more males calling, it's sort of back to back to back and they overlap and so it's hard to tell. But again, it's this sort of low pitch trill that lasts about five seconds. Again, it can be up to 15, but they tend to be shorter, three to five seconds. Um, so here's some footage. This, this one doesn't call in the video. I couldn't get him to call on video, but you'll see what the sort of their positioning looks like as they're in the wetlands preparing to call to attract females. Uh, again, this footage isn't great, but we'll, we'll watch a part, portion of it. Chorus frogs calling, of course. Again, we can see this male sort of trying to pick the habitat that he'll start calling from. Again, the, some of the toads can be very difficult to tell each other apart or tell species apart. And so um, you know, we just went over the Canadian toad, which is very similar to the Wyoming toad, uh, which is endangered. But really the best way is to look between the eyes at what we call the cranial crest. So the Canadian toad has this U, so it's got a straight line that comes down by each eye and then they're connected in the middle at the back towards the back of the eyes so it's this U shape in between the eyes the cranial crest forms a U um, and that's the best way to tell which toad you're looking at especially when we can uh, we're in an area that might also have American toads up here so um, North Dakota has historically had American toads. Again, currently, I think they're extirpated. But if we look at the cranial crests of the American toads, those are basically like L's. So there's two separate L's. There's an L on this side of the on this eye and an L on this eye. And typically, one of them touches this parotid gland, which is one of their big poison glands. Okay. Outside of this, we're going to cover the American toad next. Visually, they, they look quite similar. And so, again, the best way to, to tell what species of toad you have is to carefully look between the eyes and look at the pattern of the cranial crests. Okay, so the American toad, Anaxorus americanus. Okay, again, same size, about two and a half to three and a half inches long. Background color is typically cream to brown. Again, dark spots. Um, American toads tend to have less warts within their spots, so they typically have one to two warts rather than, you know, one to three or three to five. Again, the belly is light or cream, but is spotted. 
Uh, and these typically have a much smaller range in North Dakota. Again, we used to find them in eastern North Dakota, um, but I haven't been able to find one here probably since 2015. Uh, and so they're probably currently extirpated from the state. Although, again, again if you go into lake country in Minnesota, they're, um, they're quite common um, in sort of western Minnesota lakes. So if you have a lake cabin in western Minnesota and you find a toad by it, I can pretty much guarantee you it's going to be an American toad. Okay, so again, this brownish cream background color, darker spots here, one to two. Oh, this one's three. This one's three. So at most, they tend to have three to four warts in their spots. Canadian toads tend to have more. It's not really a great definitive characteristic, right? But if we look at the dark spots, how many warts are in it? But again, the take home here is to look at the cranial crests between the eyes. We can see that this is an L, this is an L, right? If I outline it for you there, we can see that there's basically an L on either side of the eye going from the midline to the lateral aspect over here, the parotid glands. So you can see this one actually touches the parotid gland, this one does not. Whereas if it was a Canadian toad in between the eyes, we would expect to see something like this, a, a U shape. Okay? But again, aside from that, they look very similar to Canadian toads. Again, we can see some of the speckling on the belly. In fact, one of the reasons we probably don't have Canadian toads anymore is that they can hybridize with uh, American, or we don't have American toads anymore is because they hybridize with Canadian toads. So here's an individual that we found in the field a few years ago. It has a U and the L, so this is most likely a hybrid between an American toad and a Canadian toad. But again, that's the best way to tell the two apart is to look in them in between the eyes to see what the cranial crest is doing. Again, very spotty distribution in North Dakota. Again, we found a few down, actually two down here in 2015, but none since. Uh, I actually think this one was probably a mistake and most likely was a, a Canadian toad. Again, they have a trill much like the Canadian toad, but it lasts much longer. It's typically five seconds on the short side, 30 seconds on the long side. It's higher pitched and it's much more musical, right? And so it sort of tends to be this really melodic hum that lasts for 30 seconds or so. So let's uh, take a quick listen to what the American toad sounds like. This should be an isolated individual, so you should be able to hear it better. So again, well, that's a slide there, but uh, much higher pitch, much more melodic, and much longer lasting. That's the trill of an American toad. Uh, next is the Great Plains toad, Anaxorus cognatus. Um, so this one's a little bit larger than the American and Canadian toad. Um, they tend to get three and a half to maybe three and three quarter inches. Uh, they tend to be a little bulkier than the, the other two species that we've talked about. Uh, this one is, is variable, but not nearly as variable as the American and the Canadian toad. They've got these really large blotches on their back. So we can see these really large black or dark green blotches. Those blotches are typically bordered by white or sort of cream color. Uh, and the background is typically a, a greenish color. And so, again, it can be sort of brown or yellowish, but predominantly we see this green background color with sort of dark green or black spots that are outlined in white. Um, the belly is not spotted, uh, so again, the previous two species had spots on the belly, this one does not. Um, this one is fairly distinctive because of these really large blotches where the Canadian and the American toad have really small blotches. And again, these blotches are almost always outlined in white or light, and that's not the case in the American or Canadian toads. Okay? So again, this one's sort of more brown in coloration, but again, darker spots outlined in white, really large spots, and again, a uh, clear belly. Again, it's white or cream, but there's no speckling like it is in Canadian and American toads. Okay, so again, if we look between the eyes at the cranial crest, it, it is similar to the American toad, but instead of two L's, we really see that in between these two, they so they come together at the midpoint, and then one follows one eye, the other follows the other eye. So they're much more angled uh, than the L's that we see on the American toad. Uh, in general, both of these will also connect to the parotid glands on either side, these big poison sacs. Okay. 
So again, if we want to look what it looks like schematically, here's the Great Plains toad where they meet in the middle. In the American toad up here, they do not, right? Again, a pretty widespread distribution throughout the state. They're not as common as the Canadian toad. Um, they can be locally abundant at times, um, but they um, tend not to be as distinct. They're harder to find, especially during the day. They tend to be much more nocturnal than some of the other toads. Um, but again, a wider distribution than the American or Canadian toads. Their call, again, is a trill. All toads sort of have this trill. Um, I call the Great Plains Toad the machine gun toad. It sort of sounds like a, a robotic uh, machine gun, or if we're spinning the wheel and the price is right, do 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 do. Um, it's sort of this um, chicka 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 um, call. Again, often calling in the distance, you don't often hear get them to call close to you, so you um, you sort of need to know what it sounds like in the distance. But let's take a, a listen to some of these. So here's one isolated. You can hear what it sounds like. Let's start over. Again, you can see why they call it the price of price is right wheel. And now this one, I think we're going to turn this one down a bit. This one's got a goose that's right near the mic. And there, you can hear in the background that. Doo -doo 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 and this one's being drowned out by birds, but in the background we can hear that. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, uh, on to the Woodhouse's toad, uh, an actress Woodhousei. Uh, this is the largest toad in North Dakota. It's almost five to six inches long. Um, these are just big, adorable toads. Uh, found mostly in the central part of the state. Uh, their background color ranges from sort of this cream to a darker brown. They've got large blotches on the back. Not as large as the Great Plains toad, but a, bit, a little bit larger than uh, the American or Canadian toads. They've got warts within those spots, uh, but they tend to be dark warts, not red or orange. No spots on the belly, uh, and they almost have, always have a nice white stripe down their back. Um, which you sometimes get in Canadian and American toads, but it's much more consistent and much more distinctive in the Woodhouse's toad. Okay, so again, we can look on the right-hand side here, and we've got this belly with no spots, right? So it's, if it, the belly isn't spotted, it's either going to be a Woodhouse toad or a Great Plains toad. Well, there's one more option that we'll talk about in a second here, but... Um, if it's spotted, it's got to be a Canadian or American toad. You can see that they've got these dark spots and then the warts inside there, but the warts are much drabber than the warts on the American or Canadian toad. Um, again, if we look at the cranial crest, it's similar to the American toad where they're L's, so they're not connected in the middle. Uh, but again, in this case, they both go all the way to the parotid gland. So if we look at what they look like schematically, um, they're sort of more straight up and down than we see in the American toad, and they both make contact with the parotid gland. Um, at this point, or you know, the other characteristics are more definitive for the Woodhouse. So American and Canadian toads take time to learn to distinguish the two. Um, it should be quite simpler to, to tell it's a Woodhouse's toad or a Great Plains toad from an American or the Canadian. Again, here's one in situ, again, found in the, the central part of the state primarily. We can see that nice white stripe. Uh, here you go. Look how, I mean, look how big this, this guy is here. This was a male we caught. We can tell by the, the thumb it's a male. Uh, again, nice big eyes, clear belly, um, sort of greenish spots with dull warts. This is a newly metamorphed individual, so there the warts are kind of colorful, but the color tends to fade uh, as they get older. Um, I'm, I don't sure, I'm sure, I'm not sure I buy any of these Eastern North Dakota identifications. They tend to be older and I, I I'm, sh I'm more convinced that that's misidentification again around the Missouri river Valley and Western part of the state is where we're going to find them. So really in this portion of the state, central, South central to Southwest North Dakota is really where you're going to find them. We might see them pop up in a few other counties, but I really don't think they're in the Red River Valley. In all my years, I've never seen one in the Red River Valley. Um, 
Wood houses toads scream. It, it, and it can be very off-putting if you if you're camping in the spring and you don't know what you're listening to. So it's this sort of the short nasal um, And so while the other toad sort of had this really sort of melodic trill, this is really much more of a scream. Um, there's some other species in other parts of the country that are, are, are scarier than this, I think. Uh, but if you don't know what this is and you're camping in the spring, this could be slightly off-putting in the middle of the night. But... So again, this... Wah! Again, it's a large toad, so it can get quite loud. So again, not really a trill, but sort of this wah, um, about two to three seconds in length. So we have one more species of toad to cover, but again, these four tend to be the most uh, confused from e from each other. Again, especially the Canadian and the American. So the American and the Canadian visually quite similar. So you really have to rely on the cranial crest. Is it a U, which would tell you it's a Canadian, or is it two sort of angled L's, which would tell you it's an American? The Great Plains and the wood houses look different from each other and from the American and the Canadian. But again, they each have a definitive cranial crest pattern that you can learn to tell those four species apart. Uh, the last species we need to talk about is the plain spadefoot toad, Spia bombifrons. Um, so this is a smaller species, only about two inches in length. This is a toad, but it has sort of smooth skin that tends to be moist, and that's because these toads are found underground primarily, like they rarely come out. So they'll come out during storm events in the spring and the summer to breed. They'll breed in like a tire rut or anywhere where there's standing water. Um, they take like two weeks to go from eggs to toadlet. Like they go through metamorphosis very quickly. Um, and actually it's under two weeks if the temperature is right. Um, they're quite variable in color. They can be light gray to brown to sort of this reddish color. They've got small red or orange spots on their back. Their belly is plain and white. Um, their eyes are quite distinctive. So again, we don't really need to talk about the cranial crest here because they're so definitive here. They've got uh, spades on their back foot or tubercles. That's why they're called spade foot they use for digging. But these sort of large eyes with elliptical pupils, that's different than the other species. Um, so again, if we look at this toad, again, the skin just looks smooth, which we would not expect from a toad, but this is a, a terrestrial toad or a subterranean toad that spends almost all of its life underground, comes up to breed, eat, and then goes back down, right? And here you can see on the hind feet, these black tubercles, that's why they're called spade foot. That's what they use to, to dig. So they sort of dig backwards into the soil. Um, again, we don't see these very often because we really need these storm events for them to come out. Otherwise, definitely not during the day, maybe sometimes at night, but really in spring and summertime rain events, that's when they're going to be out. So if you want to find spadefoot toads, go out in the rain in the spring and the summer and keep your ears open. Uh, again, mostly in uh, southwest or central North Dakota, we get a few... Um, sightings outside of that area, but because they spend so much time underground, it's really hard to get a good idea on the distribution of this species in the state. Um, they don't have a trill or a scream. They have a snore, really, a, like, a, like a true snore. It sounds like a robot snoring, right? It's just sort of this raspy hack that's repeated every second or two, right? So let's take a listen to see what a spade foot toad sounds like. So again, just this really sort of robotic snoring. And again, they're going to come out and sort of do these mass breedings during rain events. So you might hear, you know, 50 of them calling all at once, right? Um, and then never see them again for the next decade because they spend so much time underground. Okay, well, that's the frogs and toads of North Dakota. Uh, hopefully this helps you identify the difference. Um, 
again, we encourage you to respect all wildlife, leave it in place, but also we want you to get out and enjoy North Dakota. Sign up for the Herp, uh, for a Herp Mapper account, download the app, and when you're out camping or hiking or uh, canoeing or kayaking or um, checking on the cattle, if you see a, a reptile or amphibian, boot up the app, take a picture, and upload the identification so that Game and Fish and myself can help learn more about North Dakota reptiles and amphibians and where they are. Uh, so herpmapper.org or North Dakota Herp La- herpatlas.org. Again, if you have any questions, contact myself or North Dakota Game and Fish.